Hello, my name is Celine Gamble and I'm a Conservation Project Manager at the Zoological Society of London and Visiting Researcher at the University of Portsmouth's Institute of Marine Sciences. ZSL is an international conservation charity dedicated to creating a world where wildlife thrives. I'm based in the ecosystem restoration team in our conservation policy department and the work of our team ranges from European eel conservation to fish monitoring and marine mammal monitoring on the River Thames and to marine habitat restoration around the UK, such as oyster restoration. And today I'm going to be talking about restoring the UK's forgotten oyster reefs. So when I say the word oyster, what first springs to your mind? For some, I'd like to guess that most people are familiar with oysters served in a restaurant along with a glass of champagne. And this is because of our rich oyster eating history all around the globe. Humans share an intimate love affair with oysters and the Romans were particularly keen on eating oysters and records show that they ate them in their thousands during feasts. In the 19th century, more than 200 million native oysters were sold annually on the London market, even when the population was in London was less than 2 million. There's a famous quote that I quite like called, I do love oysters, it's like kissing the sea on the lips. And that was from Leon Paul Farquhar, a French poet and essayist. So we know that oysters have been eaten for an incredibly long time. But what most people don't know is that underwater in their natural habitat, oysters come to life, capable of forming reef life structures, supporting a wide range of biodiversity, contributing towards cleaning our marine habitats and supporting other marine wildlife. For the beady eyes of you, you may have seen the spiny seahorse in the bottom um, hand corner, the small corner on the side. And that's an image taken in France in Courabon Bay. Um, and this seahorse, I love that he's kind of like checking out this little assemblage of oysters. So here is an image from the Netherlands and it's an image taken by WWF, an ARC project, um, an oyster restoration project in the Netherlands. And it's showing that they've seen kind of evidence of mixed beds of oysters of different species and also mussels as well. So before I get further into my presentation, I want to cover what an oyster is. So oysters are sessile bivalve mollusks. And as you can see here, the true oyster family as family, um, sorry, you can see here the true oyster family tree. And as a group, they're over 500 million years old. There are almost 30 different species of true oysters in the world. In the UK, you can typically find the European native oyster and the Pacific oyster. And the Pacific oyster was introduced from the Pacific coast of Asia. However, the native oyster is the only native oyster found in the UK. Here um, on the right, you can see a biogeographic range map of our native oyster, showing that they're native to the Atlantic coast from Morocco to Norway, the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. So oysters are characterized by their water filtering abilities, by filtering on particles in the water column, such as algae and detritus, taking them out of the water column. Here you can see a time lapse over a four hour period with the left tank showing the clarity of the water without any oysters inside and the right showing the water being cleaned by around 20 to um, 25 oysters. Um, and so a single oyster is capable of filtering around 200 litres of water per day, which is around the size of your average bathtub. So when you times that by the millions of oysters that can come together when a reef is formed, you have an ecosystem and habitat that is powerful enough to vastly improve our coastal water quality. So to show this in a kind of real term example, this is an image of Chesapeake Bay in the United States. And it's highlighting all about water quality and how good oysters can be at cleaning up the coastal waters. So historically, healthy oyster populations previously cleaned and filtered the entire volume of this bay in just three days. However, now with the demise of the native oyster, it now takes over a year to filter out the same um, kind of bay area, given the current numbers of oysters. And in this particular area, um, we know that there's dead zones of kind of nutrient buildups, which has led to all kinds of catastrophic um, impacts on the surrounding marine um, habitat. So oyster reefs once dominated many temperate and subtropical estuaries on Earth, and centuries of resource extraction, coastal degradation have pushed this ecosystem to the brink of functional extinction worldwide. So there was a study that carried out um, a kind of review of the conditions of reefs um, measured across 144 bays and 44 ecoregions. And worldwide, the condition of oyster reefs has been kind of categorized as poor or worse. 
And overall, over the past 150 years, our global oyster reefs have declined by 85% due to overexploitation, disease and habitat loss. Of those remaining, over one third are so depleted that they no longer function as ecosystems, particularly those in Europe, North America and Australia, indicating that oyster reefs are a really threatened marine habitat globally. So here's a nice example of a remnant oyster um, reef. It's an Australian flat oyster reef in Tasmania. And as you can see, the kind of um, three dimensional structure that oysters can build, forming um, a really range of marine flora becoming attached to it. I really like having this image as kind of almost what we're trying to achieve here in the UK, but sadly we, we're, we're not um, as far along um, with our oyster restoration projects. So this brings me back to Europe. So um, our European native oyster species has declined by 95% since the 1950s due to similar reasons to the global decline. And in the UK, we have just a few remaining populations, which can be found in the west coast of Scotland, the south coast of England, um, in areas such as the Solent and the River Fowl in Cornwall. And essentially the way that oysters have been fished means that we take out the live oysters, but we also take the shells out of the system. And it's that oyster shell, which is the preferred settlement kind of um, substrate for the oyster larvae, so the baby oysters to settle on that shell and grow. So whilst we take those shells out, we're actually taking a really important part of the, um, the need of the oysters out of the system. And it's thought that um, oyster beds once ringed the British Isles, and we think that we've lost around 20,000 square kilometres of oyster reefs. This map is the Oslan Piscatorial Atlas from 1883, and it shows the shading of um, areas that we thought we had oyster reefs around the UK. So our native oyster is on the path to local extinction and large scale restoration efforts are required to bring them back, which in turn will benefit not only people, but also the, obviously the wild that, wildlife that they support. So it's not just water filtering that oysters are really good at. Oysters are recognised as ecosystem engineers due to the range of services they provide through the hard structures they create and their biological processes. This infographic shows all the different services that oysters can provide. Um, I'll pick just a few for this purpose of this presentation. Um, so it includes, uh, for example, biodiversity enhancement through the complex structure that they support, providing a shelter and food for a diversity of different species. They can also increase fish production um, by providing suitable feeding and nursery grounds for fish, including fish of commercial importance. Um, and also they um, can stabilize sediments, for example, reducing the resuspension of sediments, which improves that water quality and clarity that I mentioned earlier. And of course, they are an excellent source of protein and have been enjoyed, enjoyed as a food source for many, many years. And I like to say, because they're small, in, although they're small in size, they are capable of making some big changes in our marine um, ecosystem, helping keep our oceans healthy and resilient, particularly during this time. So the time for restoring our um, marine ecosystems um, is now. So we're entering the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, which is aiming to prevent, halt and reverse the degradation of ecosystems on every continent and in every ocean. And it's all about creating a narrative about restoring our ecosystems. Um, and they have this hashtag called hashtag generation restoration. So we're really pleased to be an official supporter of this UN decade. Um, and this map, um, sorry, this graph here is from a paper called Rebuilding Marine Wildlife. And it's showing the growth in global restoration projects um, over the recent kind of from the 1960s to 2020. And you can see that globally, there's been an increase in all kinds of different marine habitat restoration, including mangroves, seagrass, salt marsh, coral reef and kelp and oyster reefs. And globally, we can see that there's now 1,700 oyster restoration projects. And that's not just in Europe, but it's also in the United States and um, Australia um, as well. And actually in Europe, we're learned, taking a lot of our learnings from um, international restoration efforts as well. So over the past five to 10 years, we've had 11 oyster restoration projects pop up around the UK and around 23 projects across Europe. And we've set up um, the Native Oyster Network for UK and Ireland, which is aiming to um, facilitate the ecologically coherent restoration of the oyster in the UK and facilitate information sharing between the projects that we run. We also work very closely with the um, European sister network called NORA, 
um, and all just aiming to kind of information share and learn more about the species and effective restoration methods. So earlier I touched on kind of the ecosystem services side of restoring oysters um, and these ecosystem services they provide have a benefit on various different stakeholders, um, including the local community, recreational fishers, coastal communities and commercial fishers. So um, whilst we're really hoping to kind of rebuild this um, habitat to support um, other marine wildlife and creating healthy coastal ecosystems, there's actually a range of beneficiaries um, that come along with restoring um, oysters. So that's the kind of reasons behind why we're trying to do this. So, as I mentioned, the networks that we've set up, we've basically produced how to um, handbooks, um, including all the information someone would need to set up their own oyster restoration project. And we've also um, created guidelines on biosecurity and best practices um, in, in, within the sector. And these um, publications are both available to download on our website with the link on the screen. And we hope that these publications and guidance will help facilitate further oyster restoration projects in the future. And these publications were actually built upon um, expertise and um, guidance documents that were put together um, in the States and Australia as well. So another part of our project, we've partnered with divers all around the UK, um, along with the BSAC divers um, group. And we basically ran a photography competition to try and learn more about existing populations around the UK, trying to help us understand, um, you know, any remnant populations that we may have, because at the moment we um, kind of we have very small, limited pockets around the country. And that had great success. We had many, many submissions and we're actually going to be extending that further um, in the coming months and summer. So in the next few slides, I'm just going to cover the barriers to oyster restoration um, and include a few case studies of projects around the UK. So in order to achieve restoration, we had to take a look at the barriers to um, oyster population recovery. So I think I've mentioned it in previous slides, but essentially we have a low number of mature reproducing oysters. We have a um, so in terms of that, they, with the reproducing oysters in the summer months, they release billions of oyster larvae into the system. But the fact that we have low numbers of them mean that we've got a kind of larval source issue. Second to that is a lack of suitable habitat to grow on. So that's that shell substrate that I mentioned earlier. Because that's also been taken out, we don't have the suitable habitat for the oyster larvae to grow on and thrive. And third and finally, because we dealing with such a heavily declined population, oysters have become lost from living memory of many kind of coastal communities around the UK. And that's um, kind of part of the shifting baseline syndrome. Many people have forgotten that these biodiverse ecosystems provide us with huge benefits and people are most kind of familiar with them as, as a food product. So a lot of our work is trying to communicate the other benefits that restoring healthy oyster reefs may have. So I'm going to show you a range of different um, projects from around the UK. So this project is a community led project in Loch Craignish in Scotland. Um, and it shows that um, kind of it doesn't take a huge. Well, it is huge efforts in, in these um, communities, but these local communities are really championing, bringing back their native oyster locally. So another project is the Essex Native Oyster Restoration Initiative. And in Essex, there's a huge kind of cultural and historical importance of the native oyster. And these um, images on the screen now are um, local oyster fishermen. They're seventh and eighth generation um, oyster fishermen, a father and son. And they are heavily involved with the oyster restoration project that we've set up there. And the vision of this project is to restore self-sustaining populations of native oysters in Essex that provide ecosystem services sustainable fisheries and increased biodiversity, whilst also reckoning, recognizing their importance culturally as well. So um, yeah, these are the oystermen that we, we work with locally there. So here on screen, I've got a video of the culture deployment. So when I was mentioning that um, substrate kind of issue, this is how you can start to kind of build up that seabed um, deploying the culch. Um, onto that seabed, which then once it's settled on in the summer months, it can encourage that larval sediment to kind of settle on and start to grow. And this is all done within um, a restoration box that the project has set up locally. Let's go play again. Um, and this brings me on to the third and final project um, that I'd like to kind of showcase today. Um, so this is the Wild Oysters Project, a collaboration between ZSL, the Blue Marine Foundation and British Marine. 
And basically this project has set up restoration hubs in England, Scotland and Wales. And we've introduced oyster nurseries. So here's an image of an oyster nursery, which contain 30 mature native oysters, which we then suspend underneath marina pontoons. Um, and they, in the summer months, will start to release their baby oysters and oyster larvae back into the system. Further to that, we are carrying out seabed restoration. And to do that, we're carrying out baseline surveys um, to understand what kind of shell substrate we have in the local environment, and then identifying what we need to do to try and make it more suitable for the oyster larvae to settle on and grow. We've also developed a public outreach and education program um, using the expertise that we have to kind of develop education materials in line with the national curriculum in the UK um, for Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4, inviting students to come down to these marina pontoons for a classroom session and, um, and to learn more about the marine environment and hoping to kind of inspire the next generation of marine stewards. So we're really excited that as part of the project, we've partnered with um, an industry partner called British Marine. They're a membership organisation for the UK leisure, super yacht and small commercial marine industry. And they've provided us with the kind of knowledge and introductions to six marina pontoons around the UK. And these marinas have basically allowed us to modify um, their pontoons. You can see here in the image, we've created a little hatch. Um, where you can put the oyster nurseries and clip them in um, safe and secure underneath those pontoons. And that was um, down to a huge body of work that we've that we've carried out through the Blue Marine Foundation and the University of Portsmouth to understand how oysters can live and thrive in these kind of micro habitat systems. And by partnering with our marine um, industry partner, it's also allowed us to develop communications alongside the industry. So trying to encourage marine industry and sea users to be more proactive by making space for nature in marinas and also trying to consider ways of reducing pollution and their impact on the marine environment. <clears throat> so here's another video you can see and um, that was taken by the Blue Marine Foundation um, as part of the Solent Oyster Restoration Project. And it shows what the oyster nurseries look like having been underneath the pontoons for um, a few months. And when you pull up these oyster nurseries from underneath the pontoon, you often bring with it a whole ecosystem that comes up, um, essentially because when it's underwater, it creates a mini ecosystem capable of providing home for hundreds of different species. And in this particular site, the nurseries have previously had a critically endangered European eel species um, and spiny seahorse, Kind of found in um, amongst their oysters in the nurseries. Um, in this video as well, I think a bit later on, you can see um, various different fish species kind of interacting with the nurseries. Um, and we've recorded many, many different marine species interacting with our nurseries. So we've also uploaded this footage onto our website, and I've got a link um, in some following slides on um, essentially we've uploaded this onto our website where we want people to help us to categorize and um, learn more about what's going on in these videos so a chance for people to get involved with the project so that leads me to um kind of speak out how you can get involved with these projects so um as i mentioned we're, we're really keen to try and share oyster facts and kind of debunk and share the kind of benefits that oysters can provide us with um so if you want to share that on social media with the hashtag wild oysters we'd be grateful um, you can follow our progress online or help to volunteer at one of our sites if, if you are based in the UK. Um, if you are based further afield, you can visit our website to help us with our citizen science and help us to review um, some of the video footage that we've captured from our nurseries. And here you can see our Twitter handle and, and website details there. And that leads me to say thank you very, very much um, for this opportunity to present at the festival this year. Thank you very much. All right, Celine, thank you so much. That was a great presentation and you've definitely sold me. Um, so many ecosystem services uh, that those oyster reefs do provide. And I was impressed, you know, you showed a few images of, you know, a healthy-ish reef with all that color. Um, you know, it almost rivals that of a coral reef with the amount of life and color and habitat that they do provide. So really, really cool. I've got a lot of questions, but uh, we'll, we'll start off with a couple and we'll see where we go from there. So my, my first uh, uh, area that I want to touch on is just the timeline for a healthy reef. Obviously, coral reefs, you know, they build up over time, layer upon layer upon layer. What's kind of the timeline for uh, a healthy oyster reef? Is it is it decades? Is it hundreds of years? What's that kind of look like? 
Yeah, so in the UK, we're still at the early stages of trying to find out, you know, how long it's going to take. And some of the projects have been set up for about five to 10 years now. And we're still trying to learn more about um, understanding if it's, you know, been successful. Um, so I would say that it's decades, um, but particularly with the European native oyster, we're still learning. Um, and we don't have those oyster reefs to kind of, you know, try and benchmark across. So a lot of our learnings are from the States and Australia. Um, but yeah, I would say that it's it's decades, but we're still we're still learning lots. All right. Uh, I'm curious about um, services. You know, you mentioned lots of services that these reefs provide. And I know coral, you know, along the coast can it can be a great barrier against erosion um, and storm surge and things like that. Uh, do the oyster reefs get large enough to provide a similar service like that? Yeah, absolutely. So I know in Australia and the States, different oyster species inhabiting different areas of, of the kind of coastal um, zones. So definitely the ones that are more kind of intertidal would definitely, um, when the oyster reefs are kind of thriving and healthy, they can definitely provide a, a good barrier um, for storm and coastal erosion. In the UK, unfortunately, because we're dealing with such a heavy decline, that's not a service that reporting yet but hopefully in years to come you know if we are successful in restoring um the ecosystem then that's something that we'd we'd also hope for okay so i thought those nurseries were really cool that that you were put, putting together putting under the pontoons and just seeing the life that kind of surrounded them uh, in such a short period of time i'm wondering about the life uh, you know the life cycle of those nurseries how how long do those mature oysters kind of keep doing their thing do you have to replenish it from time to time how does that work Absolutely. So we're putting in the oysters around five years of age and oysters can, you know, grow up to around 15 to 20 years old. Um, the, the work on these nurseries, we've been gaining data for about the last three or four years. So we're still learning um, about that. Um, every now and then their mortality. So we have to replace them. And that's part of our monitoring. And actually, when there are mortalities, it's, it's really helpful in learning about what's going on in that local site, particularly um, you know, in, in the different regions. So the data that we're collecting in England, Scotland and Wales is really interesting in, in learning more about the oyster species um but yeah for now the kind of oysters remain in those nurseries um and they would would eventually grow to a size that perhaps they are too large um so other projects are actually doing the seabed restoration that i mentioned with the shell substrate mm -hmm. other projects are putting oysters on top of that shell substrate so that would be an option for oysters that if they kind of grew out of the oyster nurseries as it were all right yeah that's awesome they're uh, sounds like they can be there for a bit and they're just pumping out just billions and billions of, of larvae. That's great. So I saw that, um, you know, it looked like there were kind of two parts to the restoration. One was laying down that substrate, a nice spot for the larva to settle. And then it looked like, um, you know, the nurseries or maybe directly putting some of those mature uh, oysters into the system is part of it um release of larva or is that kind of too difficult to to do so with the sorry with the shell substrate as well yeah well i'm almost thinking like you know sometimes they take sea turtle eggs and then raise them and release the young i'm wondering if the same thing can be done um you know in captivity capture a bunch of larva and release it at a specific site or is yeah, that too absolutely. hard too small yeah, so it's actually really interesting at the moment, we've had the first kind of oyster hatchery for restoration purposes be established here in the UK and in the Solent by the University of Portsmouth and the Blue Marine Foundation. And that is exactly that, trying to rear the brood stock, create those, um, you know, capture the oyster larvae, grow them on and then release them at a really small size. So we call them seed oysters. Um, so that is something that's happening, but it's still very early stages. And I guess at the moment, with the nurseries, that's what we're trying to create, you know, like brood stock suspended in, in the nursery and releasing that larvae. But there is a way of doing that more artificially um, because they are quite a sensitive species, particularly the larvae. We're still learning how to do that, but that is something that's been set up within the last few months here in the UK. All right. And one more question for you, Celine, just about maybe the challenges of, um, you know, obviously the water quality has changed um, with the, there being less of kind of that reef ecosystem, um, temperatures are changing a little bit, uh, with global warming, changing sea, uh, temperatures. Are, are there any kind of obstacles like that to, to re-releasing? 
Yes, there is. And there's lots of considerations in terms of trying to understand, because we're working with such a de declined population, understanding where they would have been. And obviously, in the face of um, changes to our marine environment, understanding the kind of repercussions of that. And the good thing with oysters, and we're still obviously learning, is that they are quite resilient um, to changes in their environment. They, they, they can be quite hardy. So learning more about the kind of um, temperatures that can impact them, for example, with um, temperature changes in the ocean, that influences when they release their larvae. So learning kind of things about that is, is really important. Um, so yes, that is kind of a barrier and, and learnings as we go along. Um, but also in, at the stage that we're at in the UK now, it's more about scaling up and trying to, you know, have more restoration sites around the UK to try and, you know, rebuild the, the ecosystem. All right. Awesome. Well, Celine, it's an absolutely uh, great project. It's definitely an important project for those coastal waters around the UK. Um, and it's, you know, awesome to see citizen science involved, uh, people getting out and, and playing a role, whether it's identifying things uh, or getting right out and helping to restore some of those ecosystems. So thank you so much for sharing that work with us. It looks like there's lots happening, lots to learn, and we're definitely going to have to have you come back and join again and update us uh in a future festival so thanks so much celine for for joining us and sharing that story with us absolutely thank you so much for having me all right thanks celine thank you